No, I think it's just, it's on here, I think. It's all gone off. Where's it all gone? Good evening, everyone. Welcome um, to this uh, yet another uh, virtual climate change. Um, question and answer event. Um, we hope very much that you will feel free to ask any questions when we get towards the end of the, um, the evening, because this is very much your, uh, your, your um, event. Uh, and it's really good of so many of you to come and join us uh, this evening. Um, this is going to be slightly different to our normal Q&A events because we are officially launching our Community Climate Champions Program to community groups across the whole county. I'm Glenn Sanderson. I'm leader of Northumberland County Council, uh, and I'll be chairing uh, this evening's session. And just to make you aware that we're actually recording the session tonight and live streaming it on the council's YouTube, YouTube channel. On our panel this evening, we've got Rick O'Farrell, the Executive Director of Place, Matt Baker, Director of Climate Change, Nick Johnson, Climate Change Programme Manager, Mark Roberts, our Senior Climate Change and Sustainability Man Manager, Rachel Bruce, Communications and Engagement Lead for our climate change work, Hazel Skur, Assistant Project Manager for Sequestration, Partnerships and Engagement, and our guest speakers tonight are two of our Pilot Scheme Champions, Liz Anderson from Greenlight Annick, and Tony Clayden from Falton, climate and nature. You can see actually how much importance we've placed upon the work we're doing on climate change by the team that is built up. It's still not a huge team, but it is a fantastically loyal, dedicated and very hardworking and committed team at the County Council. And I'm really grateful to everything that they do. So tonight, what we're going to do is, um, Matt will start off uh, by giving us a, a brief introduction to the Community Climate Champions Programme. There'll be a brief presentation on the pilot study and structure of the scheme going forward from Nick, Mark and Rachel. Then we'll introduce our guest panel to present their Community Climate Action Plans and discuss their experiences as champions on the scheme. And I'm sure they'll all be very positive. Um, and, um, and then we'll open the floor to questions. And that's when you come in um, to be able to ans ask any questions that you want to, because this is, as I said before, very much your, your evening. Thank you again for joining us. And so without any further ado, I'll pass over to Matt. Thanks, Councillor Sanderson. Um, 
As, as Glenn says, uh, my name is Matt Baker. I'm Director of Climate Change at Northumberland County Council. So I'm going to hand over to, to Nick and Rachel who are going to kind of run us through um, you know, what's actually going to happen this evening in, in a bit more detail to begin with. Um, the first thing to say is to Glenn's point about questions, the Q&A function uh, is open now. So you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can add in any questions you've got into there. So if anything kind of comes to mind through any of the presentations, then just add it in and then we'll pick that up in the kind of Q&A session, but please, as many questions as possible. Um, I mean, just a kind of quick note on partnerships. So, you know, for me, climate change and, and as delivering net zero, not just as a, as a county, but as a world, is going to kind of start and finish with the decisions that we all make as individuals. Um, you know, we can create the conditions um, as best we can to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, unless we make choices, then, you know, we won't be able to achieve net zero. We won't benefit from the county to the, to the maximum point in terms of the green recovery and the green economy. And all these things are um, are incredibly important to all of us. And they start with community interaction, they finish with community interaction. And, and for me, what this comes down to is, you know, we might think something's gonna work, but we don't know, but you guys will know and you will find out through engagement with your community. And, and that's why this is, you know, so important to what we're trying to do. And, you know, without your help, and, you know, I've got to say a specific, um, you know, thanks to, to, to Liz, um, uh, and and my brain's just gone blank to um, uh, Tony tonight, then, you know, for, for actually kind of telling us about their journeys, climate champions, and we wouldn't be able to kind of do what we're doing. So, um, yeah, thanks again for, for, for joining us and, and thanks for kind of showing an interest in potentially becoming a, a champion and a partner, a partner to what we're trying to do. Um, and yeah, I, I can't stress how important this is. So the Q&A function's open, as I was mentioned. So questions into the Q&A. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Rachel and Nick, who are going to give us a, a quick intro before we then hear from our um, guest speakers. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, yeah, my name is Nick Johnston. Um, I'm the um, programme manager for climate change um, at Northumberland County Council. Um, and uh, Rachel and I, Rachel, who's the communications and engagement lead, are just going to talk to you a little bit about what the um, Community Climate Champion Programme is uh, and what we've done through the pilot scheme and how we're taking that, uh, that forward um, to, uh, to the launch to tonight. So basically, the Community Climate Champion Programme was, was, was born from uh, our uh, recent, recently, well, uh, action plan, climate action plan that we published at the beginning of this year, so not so recent anymore, uh, in January. Um, where we have uh, developed kind of priority action areas across sort of seven different areas. Uh, those are policy, partnerships and engagement, heat, transport, um, renewable energy, carbon sequestration and waste. And the council can uh, drive forward a number of kind of infrastructure projects, countywide initiatives across some of those action areas, which will have a, a, an impact on climate change. But what we needed um, uh, support with is is really uh, local action from people who uh, understand their communities, understand what matters, um, what the issues are, what the the demographics are, um, uh, what people need on the ground in communities, and and as a sort of central organisation, it's very hard for us to reach that level of detail. So we wanted to create a scheme which helped to um, empower communities to develop their own approaches to climate change, which were. Um, community specific and um, bespoke to, to their situation. So that's what the purpose of this, this scheme really was. Um, we've had uh, 10 groups taking part in the pilot um, and those were um, uh, selected based on groups who we sort of already had some interaction with um, and um, they've helped develop the strategy uh, which we're gonna launch today. So I'm just gonna hand over to Rachel to talk a little bit about those groups and, and what they've done. Yeah, so like Nick mentioned, um, we worked with 10 groups um, as part of a pilot scheme. And um, we started this back in, I think it was March time, and we worked with them for approximately five months and then took a month out to do sort of evaluation, gain some feedback from it and um, look at how we were going to take the um, scheme going forward. Um, so the pilot group attended fortnightly meetings most of the time, sometimes it was monthly. Um, uh, it just depended on how what time everyone had to give. Um, and this was so that they could provide ongoing feedback and help shape the scheme and let us know what they wanted out of the scheme. Um, we created an um, online sort of 
digital resource hub that um, the pilot group could access and could submit pieces of information to um, and um, use it to sort of find out what was happening around Northumberland and in the country and across the world. Um, they submitted community climate action plans. Um, each group did this and, um, and we had a look at them and gave them feedback on them. And then they were invited to come along to the first Community Climate Champion Networking event um, in July, I think it was now. Um, and this map just shows that how um, where people were based and how spread out the pilot group was. Um, we sort of picked them at random. It was people who we'd been working with already would sort of had emails from a lot of groups um, asking us about the scheme. So um, we'd emailed everyone from those groups and invited them to join us. And these were the groups who put us up on the offer. Um, Nick, can I talk about feedback? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So um, the purpose of this pilot scheme was really to kind of learn ourselves. And whilst we hope we were successful in um, uh, supporting our pilot group in, in creating um, achievable action plans, uh, we obviously won't have got everything right the first time round. Um, so a big part of this process has been gathering feedback so that we can ensure as we go forward into um, uh, future kind of phases of this program, we can offer an improved um, program and make sure that we're, we're really giving people what they want and what they need. Um, so, so a few examples here that we, we've taken from the feedback of, of what worked well in, in the program. I won't kind of um, read them all to you. You can you can see them there. Um, but it did create a, a really sort of positive um, environment for, um, for sharing ideas um, and information. Um, and that kind of networking was something that I know all the uh, the climate champions really, really valued. Do you want to click the next one? Yeah. Um, obviously, there were elements that uh, weren't quite so successful um, and which we're, we're working on uh, uh, now or have already kind of um, improved upon, um, which you can see here. Um, so uh, the kind of improvements that we're making, uh, you can see here. So uh, ongoing training. Um, so we are currently uh, looking at um, leading uh, to create carbon literacy training program for, uh, for uh, community uh, members. Um, and that would be part of the scheme going forward. Uh, project management training is something that we can, we can offer. So uh, we can certainly uh, offer a little bit more in, in, that, in that area. Um, the face-to-face -face engagement, obviously um, most of this uh, pilot scheme took, took place through, uh, through um, various restrictions with COVID and we hope going forward we would have a lot more opportunity to uh, to meet face to face. Um, we've also um, recently expanded the climate change team and we now have a, a group of assistant project managers who are assigned to each uh, one to each of the um, local council areas, uh, local area councils in Northumberland um, and as we go forward that would mean that um, there can be a dedicated climate officer for each kind of region of the county um, going forward um, and uh, funding so um, trying to uh, create more funding opportunities linking up with local businesses is something that we can we can um, explore and, and are trying to as well um, and also ensuring that we spread the word on any funding opportunities that we become aware of um, that are appropriate for for communities. Okay, thanks for that, Nick. Um, so based on the feedback going forward, um, we're following a similar sort of um, structure to what we um, did with the pilot group. So we're not going to do, the only difference is that we're not going to do as regular meetings. So like Nick said, we'd probably be more open to do one-to-one -one meetings with groups or um, in-person meetings, but we wouldn't necessarily have like fortnightly meetings with the whole um, cohort. Um, so there's going to be introductory meeting, which will be held virtually, um, and the um, the we'll we'll try and fit in some uh, training into that session, and we'll um, explain the structure in more detail. Um, we'll open up the resource hub to everyone involved um, and give them access to it. Um, and we'll also be generating fortnightly updates um via an uh, email newsletter which will go out to all of the champions and this will sort of update on anything new that's hit the resource hub um anything any kind of information that we want to share with them and um, the champions can get in touch with us and ask us to share information across the group as well um, this way and then um they'll 
all the champions will be required to submit a community climate action plan. Those that are part of the um, pilot group who've already um, submitted one with us, they have the option to do a six monthly review um, and um, everyone will receive feedback on their action plans and support on projects. And then um, at the end of the six months, there will be another networking event for the group. Um, so I've done a sort of timeline to show how all of that would plan out and how it would look. Um, so, like I said, the pilot group was of 10 members um, throughout April and September, they attended uh, frequent meetings and um, they submitted their action plans um, a couple of months into the into the scheme. And then there was a networking event in the final month um, the, well, the penultimate month. Um, and then there was a valuation period. Um, so the first cohort would be looking at taking on an additional 15 members. So this would be 15 groups, I should say, rather than 15 members itself. But you would um, we would expect the groups to sort of put one one main person forward to be the point of contact. Um, but they could definitely share any information and stuff with their wider group. Um, so we're looking to do that from um, from the end of this session. We'll be um, opening up the application form for that. Um, and this will happen over like a six monthly period. There'll be an introductory meeting um, later on in October and um, the pilot group members will also be invited to come along to that. Um, during December to February, um, the first cohort will be asked to submit their action plans and the pilot group will have the option to do a six monthly review. Um, and then in March, there'll be a networking event for everyone to attend. Um, and then after this, we'll be looking into um, taking on board a second cohort. Uh, Nick, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So um, what we're very aware of here is that we um, need to be able to kind of scale up our um, engagement with, with communities uh, beyond what this scheme allows in terms of capacity. There are 91 people on this uh, this webinar at the moment. If all of you want to become climate champions through this scheme and we can only take 15 uh, people, then there's obviously a, a bit of a problem there. So what we're uh, what we're working on for uh, the longer term of this this program is to create a, um, a toolkit which will allow um, community members to access kind of data about their community, their parish uh, or their town. Um, in terms of the emissions and the kind of sequestration potential through through forestry and land management, the types of buildings and other demographic information, which is data that we're uh, gathering and, and working with um, at a county level anyway. That's part of uh, going to form the next part, part of our next iteration of the county climate action plan. And we hope to be able to use that to create a kind of online resource to allow this um, this empowerment of community action to be uh, kind of scaled up um, beyond the kind of quite involved process that, that this, uh, this scheme uh, uses at the moment. Um, so we're hoping uh, in the new year we'll, we'll be able to update you on that and certainly um, sort of April, September beyond uh, to, to, to scale up this and, and uh, enroll far more um, community climate champions. Was there anything you wanted to add, Rachel? Um other than I think that we'd probably still be having quite regular networking events for the champions as well to just sort of give you um, the opportunity to meet in person um, and have wider discussions amongst yourselves. Absolutely. I think one of the kind of key roles the council can play is as a kind of uh, central facilitator in um, sharing um, information, ideas um, uh, across the county. Um, from groups who, who wouldn't otherwise perhaps um, uh, meet one another. And um, so we'll absolutely continue those networking events. So that's what the scheme looks like. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Matt, who's going to um, introduce our two guest speakers who will tell you a little bit about the action plans that they've created um, and how the process worked for them. So you can get an idea of, of how it worked from, from the other side. So over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so. I guess that's the first thing I, I just want to say is um, there's loads of questions pouring into the Q&A, which is brilliant. Keep pouring them into the Q&A. Um, if we don't get through them all, we'll think about how we kind of come back to you kind of with specific answers. Just but please kind of keep pouring them in. Um, I'm now going to hand over to, to Tony and, and to Liz. I think Tony's going to go first. So Tony's from Felton. Liz is from Anik. Um, and I, I'm not going to try and do any kind of justice to what they're going to do because they're going to do it way better than I am. So 
Um, I'm going to hand over to Tony, and I think he's going to share a screen and take us through um, the work that was done in Felton. Thank you, Matt. And um, before I share my screen, this is me, Tony Clayton. If you're uninitiated, you might not know that Felton is halfway between Morpeth and Annick. Um, so I'll now share my screen with you. Tony, you've got to explain what the thing is as well before you kind of do your slide, surely. Uh, explain what, what is? Oh, you, you know, your shoulder, the thing that I thought was an invented water cylinder, but actually turns out is telescope. It's a telescope, yeah, yeah. That was it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take you through how, in effect, the work we've been doing in Felton dovetails with the work of the Climate Change Group um, and the work of the County Council. We started off as a wildlife Felton group back in autumn 20, 2019, and there we were giving people guided walks, dawn chorus walks, and um, moth trapping events and so on and so forth. And then we decided to join the Climate Champions Scheme, and I initially joined and was followed by two others living in Felton. Um, we were going on with um, our environmental work, removing about two or 300 plastic tree guards north of the village and installing swift boxes. And the swift boxes installation is just a small but significant example of where we needed help from the county because um, I inquired from planning services whether or not we needed planning permission and planning services, bless them, told me I needed to fill in a form and send them a fee. Um, but Mark fortunately bypassed that and managed to tell us that swift boxes were fine in conservation areas. So we went ahead with that scheme. We formed Felton Can Climate and Nature in July as a community interest company. And this was for two main reasons. One, we wanted very much to consult and inform the community in the villages of Felton and Thurston and the surrounding parishes. And we also wanted some kind of status so that we could apply for funding. Now that was the month when the climate action plans were meant to be submitted. And I submitted one, but it wasn't really a climate action plan because our commitment first and foremost is to involve in the community. And so that's what we did. Um, there was an event called Feltonbury, which is a musical event named after a national event you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, we launched there with a stall and a number of visitors. We displayed our projects and uh, our banner, which you can see here. And you'll notice that the banner draws heavily upon uh, images from the County Council's Climate Action Plan. Um, so they were very handy. Um, and we established a website, which I'll now take you to. Now it's on the Padlet, which is now I think called the Resource Hub. So let's go there. Now, the Padlet contains loads of interesting stuff about a whole range of different things, um, but I'll just take you to the Felton Can website through that Padlet. Um, so that basically, basically introduces us and what we're doing. It shows all of our projects, more about which in a moment, and gives people a chance to say which ones they like. Um, we have a page inviting people to get involved through things like just practical help or technical skills, technical knowledge and land, most important of all, land. And then something about us with a rogues gallery of our 10 directors. Um, then in September, we moved our display to our art gallery in Felton, where it still is. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you get there before the end of November. Um, and our first aim is to plant trees, a thousand trees in 12 months. I know trees aren't a panacea. I know that a thousand trees won't make a huge difference to the climate in terms of carbon sequestration. But anyway, it's a start. Um, and we've already got 400 trees to plant in the next couple of months. So we're we're on the old route. Um, that's a display of our projects. And basically each project had a box underneath and people were asked to drop, I like this project cards into the ones they preferred to give us some kind of guidance as to which ones were mo po most popular. And people were asked to fill in the back of, I want to help cards. 
we had some interesting um, comments there. These are the nine projects. Now, these are all in a preliminary stage. We can't do them all at once. We're not aiming to do them in parallel. Um, but we decided we needed to offer options to the community before we proceeded. Planting trees, and we're hoping to get some saplings from the County Council. That's what the asterisk means. Reducing pesticides, minimizing virgin hedge, hedge cutting, where the county can control that. And already, I think, um, the county has is making progress on, on that one. Opening footpaths and cycleways, preparing for electric vehicles, another asterisk. Um, Nick and I and latterly Mark have been involved in talking about installing a couple of charge points in Felton, on-street charge points for people who don't have their own driveways or garages and so can't install their own chargers. Conducting a household carbon footprint survey, another asterisk because we're drawing on the work done at Hunshoff, um, who uh, used a carbon footprint survey devised in collaboration with Newcastle University. We're piggybacking on that with the help of the County Council yet again. Establishing a renewable energy project, which is a long-term aim, or at least a medium-term one. Some major problems to overcome before we can do that. Recycling, repairing, and as far as possible, preventing flooding along our stretch of the River Coquette because there are still areas down in the river that are vulnerable. The most important thing was community engagement. Now we are lucky because we have a village magazine called The Bridge, where we publish loads of stuff. Um, Feltonbury involved us in a, a stall. We had about 130 odd votes cast for our different projects. Gallery 45, as I say, has got our uh, display now. We've got a Facebook page, and we've got our website that you've seen. In terms of offers of help that we received from the public, a number of people signed up to help with practical things. For example, this Friday, we are relocating a, quite a large colony of orchids um, out of the way of the dual day one near Felton um, in order to preserve them. I think it's the biggest colony of orchids in the county, but I can't be certain of that. Um, we've been offered land for tree planting. That's where our first 400 will go. Assistance with a community energy project from someone who's an expert in the field. And also with fundraising help from someone with 20 years experience in doing that. So we're up and running. We know that governments will really be decisive in determining whether or not we stay within 1.5 degrees. And between you and me, I don't think they're doing an awfully good job of it. Um, but we can all make a contribution. And if enough of us around the world did, even if it's just town and parish councils and local authorities, if millions of them were involved in something like the county scheme, then we could have an impact. Um, so this is my vision for Northumberland. Okay, it's a bit presumptuous, but I think, I think, if every town, if every village, if every parish, if every business, if every farm and every landowner and every household recognised it as their responsibility to assist with implementing the county's plan, just think what we could achieve. There aren't any superheroes around to save us. We're going to have to do it ourselves. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. That's uh, really excellent, and uh, I c completely agree with you with your point around. It, it will come back to kind of all of us to to kind of make um, make choices, and, and and our job, I think, is to kind of clear the way to do that as as best we can. Um, if there are any questions for, for Tony or for Felton or any of his experiences, please um, put them in, in the q and I might stop saying that soon because we've already got like 28 questions and, um, and I'm freaking out slightly as to how many questions we've got and how much time we don't have. And Glenn loves it when I overrun and talk too much. So anyway, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Liz, who's going to um, tell us about Alec. You need to unmute, Liz. Yes, I'm unmuted. Yep. So... That was fantastic, Tony. I think that's a real inspiration to everybody. Oh, thank you. Our project really comes under the heading partnership and engagement. Um, and this is a field that I suppose my husband and I, um, he an ex-science teacher, um, really feel comfortable with because we've worked in 
performing arts and that sort of thing all our lives and in voluntary sector stuff. So I guess you go with who you are and what you are, at least for a start. Um, so I'm Liz Anderson and I'm here as a member of something called Greenlight Northumberland, which grew out of our local book group actually uh, during the pandemic. We followed the Climate Change Committee's Climate Assembly online talks, which were absolutely excellent. And that committee advises the government, um, if they're listening. Um, these talks were excellent and helped us to understand climate change and biodiversity loss as, as best we could. And we continue to learn. So as well as holding regular Zoom meetings together to keep us all abreast of climate change, um, negative and positive, um, individual members make various efforts to for further the cause. So for instance, one is regularly lobbying building firms with housing developments in Northumberland to urge the use of maximum insulation and heat pumps in new builds. Other members like Graham from Corbridge write regularly in their local media on climate change subjects and press other, other schemes for their area. My personal involvement is mainly with What a Wonderful World, which is a mixed art, science and natural world events programme with the emphasis on events. Um, our strap line is getting creative now for a sustainable future. And we have also registered as a charity, as a charitable incorporated organisation, which will help us with fundraising, which is my background. Um, we, um, there you can see all our lovely youngsters from the high school, <laughs> my husband playing the pipes and, and some members of our team. Um, so our aim is to increase understanding and promote action on climate change, but mitigation in our homes, schools and communities by bringing people together at informative, inspiring and entertaining events in Northumberland. We have a small organising team who you will see here, some of them, including teachers and students at the high school, Duchess's Community High School, Annick, and other schools, one in Wooler, members of Friends of the Earth, Annick, musicians, artists, farmers, and scientists. Our first event will be a Climate Action Day, and I'm going to hold that up. In, I don't know whether it's going to appear on your screen. Um, so I think we can say that's the one. Um, that's on the 23rd of October at the Northumberland Hall in Annick from 10.30 till 5. The day will start with music from local school musicians. And they're all very good. Um, next will be four short talks by regional experts on green jobs, heating the home, sustainable forestry, and local transport, followed by a question and answer session for the public, people who come. Music and drama will be provided by students from the high school, uh, to be followed by a big interview about the United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow in November. We'll have more music from the winner of the Climate Change Song Competition for schools, a trash fashion show all about sustainable clothes, with some clothes being uh, shown made by students. And then a session on top tips for sustainable living by members of the high school debating society. The event will end with everyone invited to join songwriter Sandra Kerr in singing our theme songs, It's Cool to be Green, and of course, What a Wonderful World. Plans are then well advanced for our weekend festival in June 2022, which will be at Annick Playhouse and Library, uh, the Town Square in Annick, and other nearby venues. We will have a national speaker on climate change and or biodiversity loss, a climate cabaret by a, an excellent uh, poet and comedian, Kate Fox, There'll be workshops, talks, a concert with professional artists, 
alongside youth performers of music and dance in many genres. Um, this could be a literature event um, and a farming for the future gathering for farmers and the general public. We are planning to display a map of Northumberland showing all the excellent initiatives that climate champions are planning that Rachel has been working on. So I look forward so much to hearing about all the new projects as well as the ones that have already got started, <clears throat> which are very inspiring. So that when we're talking to people in our community, we can give a sense of a critical mass of people in Northumberland working hard to turn the tide in the fight to save the planet. Um, you can see there, we have a website. It's www.whatawww.org. And we've, we've been sort of learning how to do all these things. I have to say, we also have um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts. And we've, we're very much beginners on doing these things, but obviously they're very important for us to get our message out. Um, so I think that's all I have to say on that. So very happy to answer any questions. Uh, th th thanks very much, Liz. Um, and I guess just touching on that last point you made and then one other point to make. So, you know, part of the work with the climate champions can can help with exactly some of that, some of the kind of the training and skills around kind of social media and kind of how to use those channels. And I think that's part of the, the role we can play to kind of um, help um, provide some support in, in that area, as an example. Um, we are um, uh, now just going to hand over to Glenn for, for some questions. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to kind of preempt one of the questions in the chat, uh, which talked about um, effectively kind of how will you measure success as a champion group? And we'll talk more about that in the full answer, but I just want to use a little example. So Liz is engaging with the Duchess um, High School, which is absolutely awesome. Um, based on some kind of very kind of crude maths, which I won't go into all the detail of, if, if she manages to engage that entire school, that's probably 1.7% of Northumberland, right? When you think about how people connect with each other. So part of the measures for this will be that kind of cascading snowball effect that, that Tony alluded to too. So although it might feel like you work in your community, that ripple effect is, is kind of super important. Um, and I think the schools are a, a kind of great example of that. Um, Glenn, I'm gonna hand over to you to um, ask some questions of Tony and Liz. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, all I'll say is I think the work that you two have done uh, with your groups ha is fantastic. It really is. Um, achieving so much in such a short time. I suppose, I suppose the, the, the real question is, what have you found has been most satisfying, stroke, easy to achieve, and what is holding things back? What makes you frustrated? What what are the what what are the key tasks that you want to see uh, achieved that are going to be the most hard in your uh, community? So, uh, either of you, Tony. After you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the challenges are really you feel as if you're working blind until we do this climate action day. We honestly don't know who's going to turn up. We are doing our marketing and we are trying to hit our target groups. <clears throat> but it really is a challenge to know whether we'll just get, you know, the, you've heard of the echo chamber effect. Mm. Will, we get out, will we get outside that echo chamber? Will we really be able to, through the kids, I mean, through the students, um, get the families, the, the, the mums and dads and grandmas to come because the kids are doing music? So they will listen a bit and hear a bit. So I think that it's a challenge in a way. Um, and the good things, well, sorry, what was the other part of your question, Glenn? What well, we the, 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 que <coughs> the, the question, I suppose in a way, what, what's, wor what's worked well and what's not worked so well that's getting you a bit frustrated, stroke, impatient uh, in what you're trying to do. Um, so, I, either back to you, Liz, or maybe Tony. Well, I've, as I've just said, I think what is worrying me a bit is our um, lack of experience in using social media. We just love to find a young person um, who could help us do this. That, that's where I find 
I'm a little bit nervous. Um, the good things that came out of the, the whole process um, of climate champions was just seeing the huge range, even with our first group of projects being planned, uh, really very amazing. Um, and, and they're now put, being put into action. And then you also learn from what people found was a, a problem. So you learn a lot from that. And I think having to do the, the action plan was good because I'd already written a, a publicity um, document, which is part of my background, but it was really good to be able to, inter to, to modify that, to fit the um, action plans you want. And then of course, having the whole framework of the county uh, council community action plan, it really gives us um, something very, very substantial to, to help us see the future and where we're going with all this. It was actually, before, before I come to Tony, I'll add another uh, question for Tony. Um, so what's gone well, what's not gone so well, what's frustrating, what's really satisfying. But I suppose, could I just pick up on the point that, um, that was made about lack of, fi lack of um, financial support from the County Council? I, I, I wonder if you could expand, I, both of you, um, on, on what more you would like us to do that would help you make more progress more quickly, I guess. So, Tony, the first question first about what's going well, what's not going so well. Okay. Well, the... Uh... Clearly, there are certain sort of um, quick, quick achievements um, which involve things that we can do as a group that are under our control. Um, so it's no problem for us to go and plant wildflowers so long as we've got the land. Um, so we've got this offer of land for tree planting and wildflowers, but it's only a small area and we will need more. Um, and if we were ever to move, I hope we will one day, on the uh, a renewable energy project for, the, for Felton and Thurston, then we'll need quite a bit of land to do that. It probably would be a solar farm, but um, landowners are sometimes rather um, jealous about the, the own land they possess and don't necessarily want to share it or lease it and probably certainly don't want to give it away. So land is a key thing. That's an obstacle. Um, funding is an obstacle too. Um, I do believe the county has run Meet the Funders events in the yes. past. Mm. So something like that, whether or not it's dedicated to the climate champions, would be useful. Um, and it would be useful rather than each of the climate champions and their support groups doing their own research into possible sources of funding for these sorts of projects. It would be really helpful if that could be done centrally so that there's not so much duplication. Um, as Liz implies, I've certainly found your colleagues very, and you, Glenn, if I may say so, really supportive. Um, and that's, that's key. Um, it's been great to have a sense of being backed officially, you know, by a, a large organization with clout. Um, I'm not completely certain that you've got planning services on board. Um, so you might want to sort that yourselves, because um, like with, likewise with that swift boxes example I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, okay. Whatever uh, we do, don't mention uh, the pl don't mention planning. Yeah, I, shall, yeah. I, shall, I didn't mention planning actually. <laughs> you must have imagined <laughs> it. Mentioning planning, appreciate that. that's actually helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, actually, you, you, th that's a very interesting point. The whole question about planning and trying to get instilled into new housing development the kind of things that we want to see. And it's much harder than I thought it was going to be um, because planning and the local plan and so on, and getting developers to all buy into this is much, much harder than I thought it was going to be. I thought everyone wouldn't have a problem, um, you know, making sure that new houses were absolutely uh, ticked all the boxes. But it, it's not like that. I just want to just touch on one thing that's frustrating for us as a county council, which is that we, we've carried out this glass recycling, <coughs> pilot, which has gone really well. We're waiting, though, for, for more about that and also more about the environment generally in this new environment bill from government, because we mm -hmm. can't really do very much more on either rolling out more glass recycling or um, food waste or that kind of thing until we know more. So we're, we're finding that slightly frustrating um, that we're still waiting for um, for more say from government on that. Um, Liz, come back to you for a second, um, just on, on the question of financing and the support of the County Council. Can we do any more to help community groups like yours? 
Well, I think Tony's idea is very good to uh, combine our efforts. We have applied <coughs> to um, Annick Town Council and one or two other local organisations, and I'm in the process of putting in a lottery bid for our big festival next year. Um, but I'm quite sort of experienced at doing that, and I'd be happy to share my experience. Um, but I think the council would be very good to get everybody together on that theme. Right. Okay, I think that's something that we can probably do, um, Matt, Nick, uh, and Rachel. Um, that would be good to see. And we are, we will plug on our own social media channels the um, the 23rd of October, won't we, Rachel? Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, anything else that you particularly wanted to raise before we move on um, in terms of what you've done, what you're feeling sort of most proud about, what, what you know, the, the, the kind of things that may be a more of a challenge moving forward, um, I, either Tony or Liz, before we move on? Well, one obvious thing, uh, which your colleagues and probably you know about anyway, is the fact that a community energy project would need to be connected to the grid and there is no spare capacity for new connections within this part of the Northern Power Grid network. So we're stuck, even if we had a, a scheme in, in train, we couldn't implement it. Um, you also will know about the local e electricity bill currently before parliament, um, which seeks to try and remove an enormous financial hurdle that gets in the way of community energy projects, which is that if you generate energy, you have to pay an enormous sum um, in order to effectively be approved. Um, I think it's something like a million pounds, but I, I don't know the details. So those are clearly beyond the direct control of the climate champions and the county council, but anything the council can do to lobby the government or Northern Power Grid to overcome those problems will be much appreciated. Well, I'm actually, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm proposing a motion at um, November full county council uh, about the local electricity bill. Um, and seeking support from the council to lobby and do what we can on that. So um, that, that, that is already in the system. So that hopefully that will help. And I'm also down at the, um, the Conservative Party conference uh, for a couple of days next week and seeing uh, one or two people that, are, that I need to see uh, about this area. Liz, anything else to add before we move back to, uh, to, to Matt? Uh, perhaps to say that everyone can make a difference. Um, by working on our own projects uh, in our communities, we can empower others to get started. So you don't have to wait for somebody to say it's okay, I mean, to put a project through and to join the champions. Um, it is a bit scary sometimes, but we're learning how to bring climate and biodiversity issues to people's attention. And we need as much help as we can really, because this is a, a complex area um, which we find ourselves getting in knots with long words and concepts, which, you know, if you've not done much science, uh, you, you need a bit of help with. And I think that's what we're trying to do with our Climate Action Day and bringing in music so that people can write about, put their ideas and use their imagination to think about what it means for us and what the world will be like, but how good it could be if, if we succeed, that we will achieve clean air, we will achieve local food. We've got so much we can work at, but unfortunately people get, dis to get mired in despair and lose hope. And that's what we try to do is to bring hope to people. And I think that's what we can all do through these schemes. Here, yeah, here, yeah, yes. Glenn, can I mention one yeah. more thing? Please. Which is the local nature recovery strategy. Yeah. Um, Felton Can is deliberately called climate and nature because the two are so interlocked. Um, and of course the county's working on its mm. local nature recovery strategy. And I guess this will happen anyway, but it'd be great if that could really dovetail closely with the climate change action plan. Uh, that's an exceptionally good point. I'm going to ask uh, Matt or Nick to pick that up, um, the work that we're doing on the, uh, the local nature recovery plan. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, can I thank you both very much indeed for everything that you've done? Because it, I, I honestly am amazed at, at, the, at the commitment 
and the hard work that's gone into both those uh, community projects. The only way we're going to get to where we want to get to is if communities help us. Uh, we, we can't dictate there. You've got to tell us and do, you know, work together on this. So all I can say is thank you ever so much for all that you've done. It's very much appreciated. And um, there, there may well be some questions uh, coming up shortly. I'm going to pass back to Matt. Do, do you want, Matt, do you want to just touch on the local nature recovery plan that would, the work that we're doing just briefly? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take as the first two questions, Tony, your two questions, one around um, uh, centralisation and the power grid and the one around natural recovery strategy. So, um, uh, action area six, yes, I think it is, is sequestration, um, and and that is basically the way we lock into the national, the the, um, the 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 nature recovery plan that um, you've referred to. So as it happens, Hazel um, Skur, who's kind of on this call, that is, um, she's our project manager, kind of faces off into that space. So we're linking together with the team looking at the forest, um, but also the team looking at. Um, uh, peat and, and rewilding and all those things and, and biodiversity and as an example of that we're currently um, in discussions with um, the national park um, around um, a peat survey and I should say national parks because that, that needs to be both the, the Pennines and, and Northumberland so very much you know kind of we see exactly as you do these two things are kind of absolutely integrated and um, Kind of, kind of, they're so codependent, and as we know, we sequester more carbon than anybody else um, uh, in terms of local authorities in England, and <coughs> we want to kind of do more of that faster and further, and 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 that might be flowers, that might be peat, that might be trees. We we don't discriminate. We just want the, the best product in the best place. Um, so hopefully that that gives you some uh, level of encouragement. Um, the centralization point you made, I couldn't agree more with. And I think the power grid example you raised is a good connected point to that. So I think the issue we've got at the moment with the power grid is we are kind of knocking their door many different times. Um, and every time the answer is, oh, can you give us a million quid? Um, to which everyone says no. Um, so I think what we need to do and play a role in this is bring all of that together, all the community interest together where they want to and they've got, you know, the right and buying from the community to kind of do something, be that through solar or, or, or some, some other renewable product, which requires linking into the grid or a district heating scheme, whatever it might be. And I think we need to be that kind of collective voice for the whole county so we can go to grid and say, right, this is what we need as a whole. What can you do? So the channel is open with Northern Power Grid. And um, I, I kind of have to say kind of thank you to to Glenn and specifically Richard uh, Wearmouth who's kind of helped to kind of open up that, that door for us. So we've got a very good route into the power grid. Um, what we now need is the information which allows us to to kind of um, really follow through with that. And that isn't the theoretical information of, of where we think the gaps are, which we, we can give them. We've got some of that. It's more about where there's an actual need now um, to do something that um, uh, is, if you like, sure ready. And um, the last thing I'll say on that is that there's there's definitely kind of government money available for investment in this sort of thing at the right scale so they've recently announced um, i think it's through bays um, some funding um, which is called contract for difference funding for, for those people who kind of uh, uh, sort of understand the financial lingo um, but basically that that's money which would both kind of give you a return on on a, um, an on investment in terms of the the price of jet energy generated but also give you a capital investment up front to kind of do the work but it requires a certain scale um, so um, I, I think yeah, the, 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 the funding's there, um, but if we can kind of tap into that through a kind of collective desire, then I think we, we can do quite a few things but by working together rather than, you know, working in pockets. Um, so I'll, I'll, I hope that kind of answers those questions. Um, I'm going to now look over at this screen because this is where the actual questions are. So we've got 59 questions apparently in the Q&A. Um, I talk really quickly, but even I wouldn't back myself to answer 59 questions in the time that I've got available. Um, but we will do our best to get through as many as possible. The first thing I acknowledge is we've got a lot of questions um, um, about, about the um, partnerships, which we would obviously expect. We've also got quite a lot of questions about transport, waste and housing. So everything else, which is fantastic. Um, if we don't get to those, we'll think about how we answer them, which probably gives us our agenda for the next one of these events. So we might give you a kind of answer on the email, which would be great, but I'd much rather have a, a dialogue and a conversation about them rather than just sort of doing it, um, you know, kind of electronically. But we'll, we'll do our best to, to kind of get through as many as possible. So Rachel's going to take the first question. Um, and um, 
so my chat's gone crazy. Um, here it is. Um, yeah, first question is, um, Rachel, um, do champions have to be part of a group already or will you try to match local people up? Um, so we had one of the pilot group champions um, came along as an individual and um, she wasn't part of a group already and she was looking to set up a group um, in the Rothbury area. So um, she obviously there was no one else from Rothbury on on the pilot group so she didn't she didn't meet other people there but she sort of managed to learn a lot of um, a lot from other champions experiences on running their groups and um, and she was able to sort of set the foundation for her, her group and now I think she has a few few other members in our group now um, but obviously the 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 idea of the champion scheme is that it is a network and forum um for like-minded people um across the across the county so um if if there are other people from your area then that would be great but it might be that that people know know other people and they can help link you up with people in your area or they can just help you develop your skills so that you can um advertise your group and uh, meet other people in your area anyone else want to add to that um Th th thanks, Rachel. I would just add one thing to that, which is I, I think it's really important that that these groups are kind of not exclusive, if that makes sense. So the more we can get people coming into groups where they don't currently um, operate, for all the reasons Rachel just said, the more this will cascade because your network is going to be different to those people. And, you know, for us, the more of these groups that can come together to form that champion network in a given area, the more effective we're going to be at, at what we're trying to do. So absolutely, yes, please. And, and you know, I guess do more. Um, the, um, the the next question, which um, uh, Nick and I are going to take between us is, so this is from um, Alex Wallace. I should have said who the first question was from, but um, I didn't. So apologies whoever answered that question. I hope we answered your question. If we didn't, please respond in the chat. Um, so the second question is from Alex Wallace. Today's student is 2030's homeowner, car owner and employee in our new technologies um, that are coming into the sleep burn ward. What are we doing with those students right now? So I think this is really a kind of a, qu a question about sort of schools engagement. Um, and you know, part of the, the partnership work that, that we're doing is how do we um, connect and link into in link into school. So we're actually working with, and, and I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, Louise Hall um, at Felton School is a kind of pilot school. So for those people who know Felton, it's actually a primary school. Um, and what, what, what she's um, uh, letting us do, which is kind of scary and exciting, um, is basically fiddle with the curriculum. So we can basically try and integrate climate change throughout everything that she's doing. So effectively, the answer to the question about the 2030s was starting with them when they're two years old. That's kind of the plan. And um, so we basically make climate change something which is interesting and exciting and not scary, which is really important for the young people. And they can really start to understand what they can do. And then hopefully they can also talk to their, their parents and grandparents and you know, kind of aunties and uncles. So it kind of cascades. And the idea being is that if we get this right for Felton, then that, that is a big school in of itself because it's a, a large primary school, uh, many sites, many form entry. Um, feeds up into um, Ashington and into Blythe but that then gives us a playbook a blueprint which we can take into other schools and we can cascade that across the county so um, that, 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 that's kind of how how we're approaching that and we're trying to like I say sort of integrate it with the work they've got to do anyway because Louisa's is allowing us to do that through the national curriculum which is really kind of her and if we can crack it for them then I feel like we'll be able to kind of scale that more more broadly um, and if I kind of make that kind of super practical for a second, um, one of the things we're going to do as part of that, um, and, and we're currently exploring this to make sure that the, the maths adds up, is basically replacing their light bulbs with LEDs, because that will both save them money and it will also make a direct impact to our CO2 emissions as a council. So we're not just sort of doing it in a kind of education, theoretical study way. It should be a really practical example. Now, I'm not saying we're going to get three year olds to change light bulbs. Don't worry, health and safety. Um, but I think that that sort of that combination of learning and, and practical action is really important. Um, Nick, I don't know if you want to um, add anything to that. Yeah, just briefly, um, another sort of point of engagement. We do have a representative of the youth cabinet um, on our uh, um, climate change steering group, which meets quarterly and, and contributes to the 
um, <clears throat> the programme of work that we're doing. So we, we get input through uh, through them as well um, to inform the, the, the strategy in terms of um, engaging with students and young people. Th thank Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, right, I'm going to hand this next question to our resident bid writer, um, uh, Mark Roberts. Um, so Mark, um, get ready for this one. So this is a question from um, Mark Dodds. Um, so Mark Dodds asks, what community groups really need is support in grant bid writing. Often people have extraordinary creative ideas, but they don't know how to put them into action formally. The structures around them feel remote and look opaque. And then when it comes to acting, finding um, seed money to get things underway, they're out of depth in language for writing and making applications. So um, I guess the first thing, Mark, is I can empathise with that question, because sometimes when you deal with kind of bids from central government, it's mumbo jumbo. Um, uh, but Mark um, is an expert at this. So, I mean, I guess there's a question here for Mark around maybe examples of how we support communities to do this in the past and what we might do um, in the future. Yes, yeah, so we've... Um... We've, we've done a couple of things in the past, both kind of internal and, uh, and externally facing for, um, for a number of grant funding bids. And you're right, Mark, the, the language used in grant funding bids is often, um, can often be read in a number of different ways, shall we say, depending on kind of the, the mindset you've got as a kind of the, uh, the, the bid writer. It's not always entirely clear what the outputs are that the, that the funder is specifically looking for. Part of the kind of answer to that question comes with, um, with experience. You, you, you write a bid, it might fly, it might not. You kind of, you, you get your feedback and you have another go. Um, but part of it, I think, is, is often to try and kind of challenge the funder around kind of how is it that they see this funding working and, and how does, how does the funding support the kind of the, the specific objects of um, that, that, they're, that they're seeking bids for? And I think that might be something that the, the council can help with. We've had a number of schemes whereby local authorities can kind of only apply to, um, to these schemes for funding. Uh, Homeshoff was looking for, for some support for um, a school site where we were trying to get um, an air source or a, or a ground source heat pump installed. And again, slightly frustratingly, due to a, a total quirk in the way that the kind of funding was, was guised, we weren't able to put that application in for them. They had to do it separately for themselves. So we did our best to help them write the funding bid. And again, slightly frustratingly, due to the way that the funding was structured, it was on a kind of first come, first serve basis. And due to the kind of the process and the diligence undertaken within kind of the bid writing, which, which was a thoroughly good bid, and, and the, the um, Humsoff Net Zero did a, did a fantastic job of pulling all the information together, effectively was too late. So there's kind of not a silver bullet answer to how you do it. I, I would say that kind of there's, there's a couple of key points. Keep trying, because um, quite often the, the, the slightly speculative bid might be the one that ends up coming off rather than the kind of fully worked one. Um, always go in with a kind of sense of, here's what I want to achieve and what the funder necessarily wants you to try and play into. I would suggest not to try and shoehorn your project into that. Tell them what it is, because you might end up kind of underselling what it is that you're trying to deliver. And if it's a, a wider kind of funding regime, whether that be kind of central funding, whether that be kind of lottery funding, I would say there's, there's probably quite a lot of people who might not necessarily know about it, not necessarily, but kind of be in a position to bid for it. I think one of the roles that we might be able to take is to provide kind of general guidance on a fund we might not necessarily be able to kind of write the bids for you know every single um, you know community group in Northumberland because uh, despite the kind of growth in the team, we definitely haven't got the capacity to do that. But it might be that in kind of reviewing what you're looking to achieve through kind of community climate champions and the action plans being put forward and the types of funding that are available, we might be able to do some work in kind of signposting and giving kind of practical advice on what may or may not work or may or may not fly within those kind of specific funding schemes. Thanks, Mark. And um, what I would add to what Mark just said, and, and um, actually Nick and I were just talking about this earlier today, um, 
I think we can do more working with our regen um, and economy team to signpost um, these sources of, of funding and grants because you know it, there's sometimes there's so many you don't know which one to go for so um, I think there's something about how we share with this community well what grants are available and for what so we can um, you know kind of maybe direct you to things where you're more likely to be um, successful so um, what I would say Mark is if there is a specific thing you want to kind of test that with then you know we, please email the climate change inbox we will do our best to respond we're, we're we're pretty responsive and as you can probably tell we're quite keen um so we'll we'll certainly kind of um you know kind of give give that a go if you think that's useful and helpful um the next question is from anna marie salisbury um it's two questions um how will you measure the success of the climate change champion scheme how will climate change champions engage sme owners and citizens what methods will be used so um I'll, I'll take the first one um, and then I might well um, hand to Nick, um, who's going to maybe take the, the next one and talk about how we're going to kind of cascade um, our kind of um, uh, carbon literacy approach um, across across the county. But on, on the first one, um, uh, Anna-Marie, um, so I'm, I'm an absolute data junkie. I'll try not to talk too, too long about this. Um, so I think there's two different ways we can do this um, uh, initially. The first is we've got a set of key performance indicators which are kind of quite tangible, quite specific around what we're trying to do the next few years for climate change around kind of rolling out EVs, for example, um, a number of free trees given away and, and, and th th there are more. Um, but I think there's something for me around how we dovetail those KPIs into local action. So um, we, we can absolutely measure that um, to, to the nth degree. Um, and, and that might be something which we, we could do and to see what, what traction you've got as a um, uh, uh, champions and a, a lovely example of that might be there's a current grant scheme which is for insulating um, homes and providing solar and providing heat pumps for people who um, uh, basically earn less than 30 grand have an EPC of D or lower um, or get universal credit and we'll send details of that later there'll be something really interesting around how practically the groups could tap into that community to get them encouraged to to use that sort of scheme so there's very tangible things like that we can measure um, the more interesting one which is um um, uh, but perhaps slightly more controversial is we, we kind of know where the emissions are, right? Um, so if you're really successful as, as climate change champions, we can baseline and we could KPI you quite in a quite a detailed way um, in terms of your success, um, in terms of overall emissions for your um, area, for your parish, for your town, for your ward. Um, we, we have that data um, and um, that's something which we're going to keep live. So I think we could get quite tangible about that. And the last thing we could probably do is look at actually the kind of spheres of influence and number of people you've engaged with in a, um, in a slightly more kind of creative way, a bit like we were talking about with Liz in terms of the number of people through the school who uh, we've probably engaged with. So th th those are sort of the different ideas, but the real answer is, as part of this next pilot, I really want to get into that measurement point. I think that's kind of re really important. Um, because then when we scale it across the county, we'll, we'll know if we're, the investment we're making, because this is an investment, um, is, is making the difference that we need it to. Um, Nick, do you want to um, uh, take the second question? How will climate change champions um, engage with SME owners and citizens? Um, what methods will we use? Yeah, so um, I think we've seen some really good examples from, uh, from um, Tony uh, and Liz already of how they're going about that engagement in, in their communities. Um, and really, um, uh, we look to, if we can support, then obviously we will, but part of the purpose of the climate change, community climate change champion scheme is that the champions know the, the citizens and, and the people in their community far better than we do. And um, so we're there to support them with things like you know, social media guidance or um, design of a flyer or something if, if we need to, and to help them um, uh, produce the action plan, which will kind of ascertain how they'll communicate with with the relevant kind of businesses and uh, and and people within their community, um, and we can go as far as um, you know um, certainly sharing information such as um, in Hunshof they've done a, a really um, successful uh, survey of residents, um, uh, which has kind of allowed them to benchmark their their carbon footprint really um, in in real detail and look at um, where they can make. Um, the most appropriate interventions and um, sharing that best practice is a role that we can take so if other communities want to um, uh, roll out that um, um, that uh, survey then 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 they could do but I would say primarily we're, we're looking to the champions to to guide us and to be our kind of boots on the ground in the community um, 
and it wouldn't be something we prescribe as to how they should engage with with the people in their own community. Thanks, Nick. Um, and uh, next question is sort of a quick follow-up on what we were talking about um, uh, earlier in terms of bids and things, I think, from, from Mark Dodd. So the question is, what is the relationship between NCC and the North of Tyne Authority? Um, so um, uh, I'll, I'll say something, and, and Glenn may or may not want to kind of add to this, because Glenn's obviously on the cabinet for, for North of Tyne, so he's um, uh, kind of well-placed to um, talk about North of Tyne. But from a kind of climate perspective, we're linked in specifically to their kind of area of climate change. Um, and we're looking for kind of areas of um, uh, kind of collaboration. And um, specifically, we're, we're, we're looking at things like greening um, uh, the North of Tyne, which obviously would lend us into a, um, a good conversation about biodiversity um, and, and some of the things that we've talked about before um, um, in terms of tree planting, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the, the other area which is interesting for us around North of Time, but we haven't yet quite um, got this up and running with them is they have developed a green fund, a green infrastructure fund with um, uh, um, an investment company, which we've kind of co-supported with the um, other colleagues in North of Tyne. And we're just going through the process with North of Tyne to work out how we bid into that fund. And that fund is specifically for um, in, investment into supply chains and infrastructure. So um, connected into that, what we're currently doing is we're developing our own net zero investment strategy for Northumberland. Um, and coming out of that will be, well, what are the areas we want to, to really back in terms of encouraging investment into the county beyond that which you've already seen? So things like Vault, the recent um, announcement around the um, the cable factory, which I've forgotten the name of it, but um, you'll have seen that kind of in the press. So what else do we want to do alongside that inward investment, which is basically around offshore wind generation um, and um, you know, distribution of, of energy and storage? And that could well be a place where we go to for funding for those things in terms of North and Tyne, sorry, not North and Tyne. So um, it, it's definitely needs strengthening. There's more work to be done, but there's a kind of clear route now, I think, to, to, to do that. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, Glenn, Councillor Sanders, you want to um, add anything to that for North Tyne? Well, just very briefly to say, I think everything that's going on in Blythe at the moment is unbelievable. Um, uh, it's so far as uh, servicing and actually creating the uh, offshore wind generation. Um, and um, North of Tyne do have a significant pot of money that we will be uh, we will be part of. Um, North of Tyne involves Northumberland, um, Newcastle, and North Tyneside councils. Um, and uh, it works really well. And, and um, I'm quite sure that we will share in that money um, for our benefit in the county. Thanks, Glenn. And, and if, I'll just add one thing to that before I take the next question, which isn't north of time, but is our other devolution deal that we've managed to secure, which is Borderlands. And um, so um, as it happened, um, a few of us were up in Berwick on Sunday at a community event, which um, some people on this call might be um, um, uh, uh, who, who were there possibly. And I happened to be sat next to a lady from the Borders Council um, who were now kind of meeting up with. So we've already got connections into Borderlands um, uh, through the kind of the formal groups and the Regen team, but there's clearly more to be done there around um, green economic regeneration. Um, and I think those two deals together are really powerful because it allows us to tackle the kind of the, the, the whole of the county, but in two different directions. And um, yeah, I think that there's, there's a fantastic um, opportunity for funding exactly around what we're doing here, which is um, which is great. OK, um, the next question, um, which is for Rachel. Um, Malcolm has asked, are action plans shared to other groups? Um, Rachel. Um, so upon completing the action plans, the groups were free to do what they wanted with them so they could publish them on uh, their websites if they had websites or social media channels if they had those. Um, when they came along to the networking event, they were um, we printed some copies of them so that they could share them with one another. Um, but it was completely up to them who they wanted to share them with and, and how far they went. Um, and they can also um, let me know if they want them to share, be shared with us. Um, I need to have uh, another catch up with the pilot group and see who um, wants theirs publicised and on our own website. Um, and um, we'll find a way of doing that on um, on our climate change web page. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, excellent. The next question is from Alison Smith. Um, and it especially says Alison Smith for Nick, which I'm quite glad about because it's quite a difficult question. Um, so, Nick, is there any funding available from NCC to support climate projects? I've just written, why am I getting all the hard questions in the chat here? Um, so, in general, kind of, 
there's not just a general pot that anybody can bid in for for any kind of climate related project but certainly there's ways that we can we can support so let's take in the example of kind of electric vehicle charging so we're getting increasing interest from um parish and town councils or uh, individuals in the community um, in uh, having electric vehicle charging points installed in their community and um, that might be because there's currently um, very little available or it's a sort of tourist destination or it might be because there's a, a high proportion of residents without um, driveways who can't install their own electric vehicle charging point point. Um, and so that's something that the council uh, certainly could um, uh, help with um, we do have funding for, for electric vehicle charging points and um, we're looking currently at the kind of um, financial case for, for scaling that up over the next few years um, and we've uh, we've already got a kind of online tool for, um, for people to register their interest so we can build a map of, of demand around the county uh, to inform our strategy going forward so if it's something kind of tangible like that then then there's certainly support that that we can give um, there's also, as I say, um, a role we can play in kind of uh, signposting um, other available funding opportunities for uh, for communities, um, such as the, the the National Lottery currently has one open together for our planet, um, which we can um, we can um, help um, kind of promote and signpost. And um, so, kind of yes and no. There's not just a, a climate pot that that you can bid into, but yes, with with specific. Um, uh, plans and projects we can certainly um, identify whether we can help and how we can help and that's one of the kind of products of the of the, the climate action plan um community climate action planning process thanks that's a, a um a really important question and yeah i think what i would add to what nick's just said is um challenges so if you've got a specific project, um, to use that phrase, which is shovel ready, but you think the thing that needs to tip it over the line is funding, and there is an economic case for doing that. And I think this is the point, right? Climate works when the economy works and climate works together. And you know, we will assess that like any other project. And if we think um, that's going to deliver on both those fronts, then that's going to really challenge us to think about how we support you, either through central government funding that we can bid into and potentially through kind of um, f funding different ways so I, I would would really encourage people to challenge us on that specifically um, because the, the charging point Nick made is a really good one you know we can bid into central government for charge points on your behalf and then help you to install them um, but the more we can do that um, uh, th the more things we'll be able to do kind of locally and, and at the scale we need cool so I'm conscious we, it's, it's 1818 we um, are gonna we've got seven more minutes of questions um, so um, we're nearly there. Um, Rachel's asked, um, uh, sorry, Pauline asked, uh, Austin has asked, sorry, um, can community sporting groups apply to be climate change champions if there is a named representative? So, I, I mean, R Rachel can, can kind of jump in. I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, why not? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's a, there's a number of questions about active transport and being active and there's that connection between public health I mean, climate change, which we know, and the more we can bring all these things into one place, the better. So having the voice um, of, of you know, somebody who's kind of leading on the kind of public health side of that as part of that overarching kind of network of people, I, I can't I can't see but be a good thing. Um, I don't think it's a question we've had before, um, but I, unless Rachel um, is, is going to kind of disagree and Rachel is free to disagree with me at any time, because sometimes I say silly things, um, then I think that seems totally reasonable. Rachel, does that seem fine? No, <laughs> I agree with everything you say, Matt. <laughs> I Not think always. it's totally reasonable too. Um, yeah, the link between healthy travel is definitely a great one to have with um, sporting groups. So, so, yeah, please apply. Fantastic. Um, Cool. Um, there you go. Yeah. Next question, um, which is from Malcolm. Um, would you get professional help with a feasibility report into an en energy and renewable energy product pro um, project? Um, I mean, yes, is the simple answer. So if I kind of reference um, Humshoff um, as an example, and I'll also link back to the kind of comment I made to Tony before. So to be honest, you know, I would much rather have, I'll pick a number, let's say 30, renewable energy projects all hit us at once, which means we can, um, if nothing else, aggregate together the demand on the grid to go to the grid and say, here are 30 projects, they're kind of ready, they've got funding, but the big barrier is you, what are you gonna do about it? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, I'm not saying this put Glenn on the spot, because I know he would, you know, if we needed Glenn's help to kind of go and um, knock the door down of, um, you know, 
Jack Goldsmith or, or insert minister, he, he would he would help us because that's kind of what, what Glenn does. Um, so uh, the answer is yes. And I would encourage all of you to kind of um, uh, signpost those things to, so we can kind of look at them um, as, as a whole. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping Glenn didn't mind me saying that. He would tell me if, if, um, uh, if he did. Um, I, did, I missed that bit, sorry. Glenn, if we need you to go and ask a question of a minister to help knock down a door to do something, you will help us, was my question. Well, of course. Exactly. What else can I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Um, this is another one. Um, uh, so, oh, sorry, Nick's got a point to add. Nick. Uh, yeah, it was just on the point around feasibility studies. So um, our local enterprise partnership, um, which represents the, the sort of seven local authorities across the northeast, um, has recently set, set up um, something called a, an energy accelerator, they call it, which allows us to um, tap into some experts there for precisely this point on um, getting projects um, uh, through the feasibility stage um, and up to the kind of the, the state at which they're ready to, to be progressed. And um, so if there's something that um, uh, Malcolm in particular but, or anybody wants support with in terms of feasibility please do get in touch with us and we'll investigate whether that um, that avenue could be could be exploited as well and um, because of some really good expertise and, and funding available there for precisely this point. Thank Nick, thanks Nick, that's, um, that's, that's really helpful. Um, th there's um, another question now which is about active travel. Um, I I kind of also noticed the question, I think, in the questions about, um, which you could put it in the chapter to get the words right, which is about um, transport in and out of the new schools, um, which I kind of want to sort of link, link the two things together a bit if I can. So um, the, the question from Carol Boothby is, active tra travel is brilliant in theory. I agree. Um, yet there seems little real support from people like Council's Highways um, uh, or Highways England for even simple changes to improve safety and access. Can the climate change group help facilitate discussion with these bodies? So I'm going to kind of separate those two people. So the Council Highways team, um, yeah, the answer is yes. And, and we're actively doing that with um, um, the local services, neighbourhood services team that um, uh, one of my peers, Paul Jones leads. So that very much kind of is on our mind as part of um, quite extensive investment that's been made to kind of redevelop the highways, which we we have control over. Um, and, and it very much is kind of on our minds to make sure that is um, something that that is part of the requirement. And um, it's a bit like the planning one. I'm not going to sit here and, and promise that we're going to fix all of that because I, I don't think we are. It's hard and, and we are trying to change a culture and and um, I guess I want to reassure that we've got structures in place which allow us to have those conversations now and try and influence that decision making. Um, and that is a big change from where we were. So um, th that one is is very much kind of on the plan work in progress. Um, and I'll give an example of, of a practical thing potentially linked to that in a second um, for the Hexham uh, answer. Um, and then th the Highways England one is much harder um, because obviously it's highways England, you know, that's kind of outside of our, our control. It's like us trying to influence the sort of national planning guys. It comes more down to kind of lobbying and um, bringing all those kinds of um, uh, kind of things together so we can basically kind of um, look at them as the whole rather than individually. So my answer to this one is what, what I'm really interested in, um, and, and Rachel and Hazel might not thank me for saying this, is really specific examples of where you want some help around that, because if it's specific, we can then at least try and help. Whereas when it's like a generic, can we help with Highways England, it's more difficult for us. So we're really interested in specific examples of, of, of where you might need some help. So again, kind of email into the climate change champions, so the climate inbox will be the way to do that. And that will be an important source of information for us. Um, there's a question for Wendy Beach, which I'm gonna add into, um, which talks about uh, walking and cycling to the schools um, the two new schools in Hexham, I guess, is is it two schools or one school? The new site, I think, is what the question's about. Um, I think my kids go there too, so I'm particularly interested in this. So um, interestingly, one of the questions we've had recently through residents um, has been around idling cars and the dangers of idling cars, which sort of links to this a little bit in terms of people driving to schools and, and cars sitting around kind of um, uh, um, school environments. And um, 
one of the things we're considering and and we need to do a bit more work on this because we haven't yet kind of bottomed out the details is we may start to you might start to see some signage going up around idling which is going to be a little bit around sort of reminding people that it's illegal um, and also nudging them towards different behavior around climate change you might use it as a sort of a dual purpose um, project um, and um, the reason why I kind of mention that here is because there's also a connection between idling and road traffic accidents. So there's a really important triangle here between road safety, pollution and the environment. And obviously, if you are active in your transport to a school, you're less likely to be in a car. So there is a kind of a connection there. So I think we're probably quite interested in exploring a pilot around a school, um, which then links us back to engagement with young people, of course. And we might want to trial some of this. So um, that's quite an emerging area of interest for us. So I just thought it'd be worth kind of um, mentioning that to, 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 to you in response to this call. Um, so I'm going to kind of close the questions there. Um, so basically, we're going to try and we'll come back to in the next kind of couple of weeks with um, answers to your questions if we haven't answered them in, in, in this meeting. We are definitely going to look at the weight of questions and think about how that feeds into the structure of the next Q&A, which is what we said we would always do. Um, I, I would just love to say the participation in this has been unbelievable. So th thank you so much. Um, the email around the response will come from climate at northumberland.gov.uk. So just make sure that isn't going to kind of get filtered into spam um, or junk mail or, or anything like that um, uh, by kind of filtering with your kind of email filters. Um, I've just got um, sort of two other things to say before I hand back to um, uh, uh, Councillor Sanderson to close. Um, so the first thing is the, the, the free tree giveaway. Um, so uh, we're, we're giving up to um, 120 um, uh, saplings per community group. So a lot of you are representing um, community groups. Um, so, um, you know, if you haven't um, uh, applied for, for saplings, then, then apply um, uh, here on this screen. Um, you, you can also apply for, for a tree for your own um, your own house and it doesn't matter if you've got a big garden or a small garden, um, there's a tree to kind of suit your needs. Um, and the, the scheme is going to close, um, Rachel's going to jump in now and tell me when, Rachel, it closes when? Closes when we run out of trees. It closes <laughs> when we run out of trees, um, but it needs to close <laughs> before it gets too into winter so we can give them away so they can be planted before it, we run out of time so probably like what end of end of october something like that no we could go on until december probably but yeah please okay. please take a tree <laughs> please take a tree we've we've currently i think it's i don't know if you've got the number or hazel's got the number but it's like what nine thousand are we at total or is it currently we've given away yeah we're at about ten thousand now i think we're just capped so yeah we've got five thousand left Cool. five thousand left and um if, if you do get a tree you'll get to meet us in person because we'll be giving away a tree at a very cold socially distance um uh, site near you uh, sometime um in in the winter which is always fun and, and a nice time um, and then the last thing i've already mentioned it is the local authority delivery um uh, kind of a green home grant scheme that we've got um and and click here to kind of find out more details um about that so the, this is where actually we can really get your support as community champions because you know people think this scheme is too good to be true um but it really is if you meet the criteria around affordability and efficiency in your home it, it basically is a grant of up to ten thousand pounds for home improvements which will help reduce fuel bills um help make your home warmer um, and, and 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 a better environment to to, to live in um so it, it's a really fantastic scheme so um, you know, kind of please um, kind of click on there. And then last thing, most importantly, um, if you want to be a climate change champion, then, you know, please, please, please kind of click on here. Um, uh, there'll be a very kind of simple registration form to kind of put in with your details um, and then kind of send, send, send that across. And if there's somebody you think might be interested in this who's not here, then please let us know. If you're an individual who's interested but not part of a group, still please Kind of put your details in and then we'll try and link the different groups um, together so i think that's everything that um i kind of needs to cover unless um uh rachel tells me otherwise rachel is that is that all the kind of key signposts and messages excellent um i'm now going to hand back to councillor sanderson um uh, who's going to just kind of uh, close us out well i'm going to be very quick because um i just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining us tonight um it's really brilliant to have so many people uh, uh, participate 
Uh, it was a two-way thing and that's what we wanted. So thank you very much for that. I want to thank Liz and Tony for everything that they've done, everything that they're doing and will continue to do. Um, we, uh, we, we, you, you can access our climate change action plan um, by going on climate at northumberland.gov.uk. And you can also, and this is really good, there is a mailing list um, to keep you up to date with what we're doing. And that can be found at www.northumberland.gov.uk forward slash climate change. And that we'd really like you to do that if you can. Um, and I think actually from, from me, the, the interesting thing tonight is that um, I know what a great team we have and thank you all of you for what you've done this evening. Um, and they are there to help you and they are helping. Um, and we will guide you towards where there is um, lots of money that, we, that you might be able to access. But I think one thing I, I picked up tonight is that maybe we should be looking at a, a sort of small schemes fund to help uh, community groups get going with, with smaller scale things. So I would like very much, Matt, for you to, to do me a short little um, report on what that might look like so that we can get that kicked off and up and running as soon as possible. Because a small amount of money can make a big difference when you're setting something up. So we will be there to support you, but we'd also like to see if we can find a little bit of dosh as well. So um, thank you all very much indeed for joining us tonight. Um, I'll hand back to Matt, but the danger is he might start talking again. So instead, I'll, <laughs> I'll probably say if I've covered everything, thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to the next one and take care. Bye-bye.